Welcome to the American Gospel television series on spiritual warfare. My name is Jim Osman, and I'm going to be your teacher here for these eight episodes. This is episode one, titled Sufficiency and an Introduction of Sorts. Now, since I'm going to be with you for eight episodes, I thought it would be fair to tell you a little bit about myself and my own testimony before we get started. I grew up in a non-churched home. My family didn't attend church on a regular basis. We lived in a neighborhood where some neighbors invited me to church, to Kootenai Community Church, and I was just a young teenager at the time. The church presented the gospel to me a number of times, and it didn't take, and I didn't hear it, I didn't, didn't receive it, and I really wasn't ready to receive it at the time. And then through the ministry of the church, they invited me or sent me to a Bible camp, which is about 20 minutes south of where I live. And it was there at the camp that the gospel came to me, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, in the spirit and with power and with much conviction. And that's when I came to understand my need for a savior, that I was a lost sinner deserving of God's wrath, and that if I didn't repent and believe in the Son of God who died to save me and rose again on the third day, that I would spend eternity in hell. And it was there at that camp, through hearing the gospel there, that I trusted Christ for salvation. In the summer of 1987, I was 15 years old at the time. And then after going to Bible college in Pamburn, Saskatchewan at Miller College of the Bible, at Miller Bible College, um, I met my wife there and I went three years and took a summer off and then we got married that summer. Then I went back for a fourth year of studies and got a Bachelor of Arts and then moved back to Sandpoint, Idaho, where I was eventually asked to take over as the teaching elder and teaching pastor at a small church there in rural North Idaho called Kootenai Community Church. It was the same church that I attended as a teenager that asked me, uh, they sent me to camp and then asked me to, to come back now as an adult when I was 24 years old and pastor. And so I've been a pastor there since 1996. And in full disclosure, one last thing before we get started, I wrote a book on the subject of spiritual warfare called Truth or Territory, A Biblical Approach to Spiritual Warfare. And my purpose here in this series of videos is not to shill that book in some sort of a shameless fashion, but it is to go through some of the same material. And we're going to be covering kind of the format of the book, but going through the material in a much briefer and more uh, superficial way than I'm able to cover in the book itself. So I would just, right here at the beginning, refer you to that if you want more information on this subject. Now, why the subject of spiritual warfare? Why talk about spiritual warfare? And this series is going to be somewhat polemic in that I'm going to be answering some misuses and abuses of Scripture and talking about what Scripture does truly teach about spiritual warfare. And it's not what most people think. And there are a number of reasons for covering the subject matter. First and foremost, because there is a need for some clarity and some clear thinking on this issue. Most people probably don't really know what true spiritual warfare is, and many are confused about the nature of it. What does the Bible teach about the nature of the spiritual battle in which we as Christians are engaged, and how do we fight it? Do we fight it through prayer? Do we fight it through prayer mantras? Do we fight it through formulas that we say? Do we fight it through certain activities? What is the nature of that warfare, and what about the devil? I mean, Scripture does warn us about the existence of, uh, of the devil, and he's called the evil one. We know that he deceives us. Scripture tells us that he roars about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is intent upon our destruction, and he thwarts our attempts at serving the Lord, and he tries to deceive us and lead us astray. And so how do we protect ourselves against him? Is there some magical formula? Is there some list of things that we are to do? And, and what exactly are the, the reaches of his authority and, and how, how much can he do against God's people? These are all questions that we need to answer. And second reason for covering this is there is a lot of bad teaching on this subject. And I was exposed to a lot of it as a young believer. When I got saved, I knew nothing about scripture. I knew that there was a book of Genesis and I knew there was a book of Revelation. I didn't know anything about either of those two books or really anything in between. So when I went to Bible college, I was exposed to a lot of false teaching on this subject. I was exposed to a lot of false teachers on this subject. Now, that was not the fault of the Bible college staff or, or the teachers, nor was it really the fault of the Bible college itself. But as a young student, I was put into a dormitory with a bunch of other ignorant students who had embraced a lot of false teaching. And just through the conversations that we had and visiting in the dorm rooms and, and things of that nature, I was exposed to a lot of these teachings teachings about binding Satan and, and rebuking demons and, and exorcisms and things of that nature. And I was exposed to some people who had some skewed and warped views 
of spiritual warfare. Back in the 1990s, the books by Frank Peretti, Piercing the Darkness and This Present Darkness, those were all the rage. A lot of ex-Satanists like Mike Warnke and Rebecca Brown had just come out of the satanic uh, cultic movements and they had written books about the occult and about spiritual warfare and, and different spiritual warfare methodologies. And so I was exposed to a lot of these. And then another student handed me a cassette tape back then, of course, this is the age when we don't really have cassette tapes, but back then it was a cassette tape. And it was on how to reach your loved ones for Christ. And this cassette tape talked about how to get the gospel to the lost, your loved ones, and to do it in a spiritually effective way. Well, who doesn't want to win their lost loved ones to Christ? Friends, relatives, parents, etc. I certainly wanted to, so I listened to the tape. And the tape talked about how to bind the devil and plead the blood of Jesus and exercise demons from a distance and command Satan and use our authority in Christ to command Satan, praying hedges of thorns and and how all of these methodologies were intended to sort of soften up the target and to, to shake loose the spiritual strongholds into which a person may have been uh, taken captive. And then we would be able to come in with the gospel and, and lead them to faith in Christ. And these ideas circulated within the Bible college and they cer certainly found a sort of fertile soil in my own heart as I, I wanted to find the most spiritually effective way to lead a loved one to faith in Christ. So I embraced a lot of those teachings, and these teachings in today's church are widespread. It's not just in the charismatic movement or on Trinity Broadcasting Network that you see false teachers binding Satan and rebuking demons and, and calling the devil names and, and praying mantras over people to release them from spiritual uh, curses or generational curses or pleading the blood of Jesus. These are the types of things that even take place in your standard, average, average everyday community church, your little Southern Baptist church with the little old lady in the back pew who bakes cookies for the kids' Sunday school class. She may even in her home be praying to bind Satan, praying hedges of thorns and pleading the blood of Jesus and thinking that that is what real spiritual warfare looks like. There is a need in the church to return to the scriptural teaching on these subjects and really a need to evaluate what Scripture says concerning these topics and these subject matters. So that is what this series is intended to do. Uh, whether we have embraced these out of love for a loved one or out of ignorance or out of even a well-meaning desire to be effective servants for Christ, we need to be willing to evaluate our own beliefs, our own theology, and our own practices. And having evaluated those in the light of Scripture and Scripture's truth, to jettison those things that are false and to embrace those things that are true. Like many probably who are watching this series, I had embraced a lot of bad teaching on the subject of spiritual warfare. And we need to get back to allowing scripture to determine what it is that we believe on these theological issues. If, as you're going through this series, you are hearing me evaluate the things that you yourself have done at one time or another, or believed at one time or another, and you're feeling like I am I'm just destroying all of your, your favorite practices, your favorite prayers, etc. I want you to understand that in many ways I feel your pain. Having been there and having embraced a lot of these false teachings, I had to jettison them when confronted with the truth of Scripture. We need to let Scripture determine how it is that we view spiritual warfare and conduct spiritual warfare. We need to let Scripture determine and define what real spiritual warfare is. And then ask ourselves, if some of these practices that are very popular, even in non-charismatic, non-New Apostolic Reformation churches, even in very conservative churches, Southern Baptist churches, little community churches, even cessationist churches, whether these practices are indeed genuinely biblical or not. And that is what I hope that this series of lessons will do. And so I ask you, dear viewer, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to jettison false beliefs if it can be shown that these things are not at all taught in Scripture. Now, what is biblical spiritual warfare? Biblical spiritual warfare and a biblical approach to spiritual warfare really has three elements, three things. And, and our series of lessons here over the next little while, these next eight lessons, is going to kind of go through this pattern. First, biblical spiritual warfare must recognize the Bible as the sole and sufficient source and authority on the subject of spiritual warfare. We recognize scripture as the sole and sufficient source of authority and information on the nature of spiritual warfare. Second, we have to reject man-made teachings on the subject of spiritual warfare. And third, we have to rest in Christ and his finished work for us on the cross. So we recognize the Bible as the sole authority. 
We reject man-made methodologies and we rest in the finished work of Christ. And, and that's what we're going to do. Let me break each one of those down for you here for just a moment. First, we rest on Scripture as the sole and sufficient authority and source of information on the subject of spiritual warfare. Now, many of the people that I will critique later in this series, they will affirm the doctrines of biblical sufficiency. They will say that we believe the Bible is the sufficient source. Uh, we believe the Bible is the authority. They would affirm the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility of Scripture, and even the, the inspiration of Scripture. They would affirm those things. And they would say, of course, we use Scripture and Scripture alone in our approach to spiritual warfare. So when we bind the devil, we do so in the name of Jesus. And we use Scripture as our authority for doing that. They would say that they use Scripture to claim their authority over the devil, or that they use Scripture when they're performing exorcisms, or when they're canceling generational curses. They would say that scripture is, is, is woven right into that kind of a ministry and that kind of approach to spiritual warfare. But I'm encouraging you to follow me as I call you back to a biblical view of spiritual warfare and to the Bible as the only sufficient source for information about the spiritual realm and how it is that we are to wage spiritual warfare. We have to come back to the Bible to define the nature of spiritual warfare. We have to return to the Bible to for the teaching on the nature of the battle that we are engaged in and the nature of our weapons that we are to use in the course of engaging spiritual warfare. Now, that's what I mean. We're calling people back to Scripture, not to testimony derived from ex-Satanists, not to testimony derived from demons in the course of an exorcism or a power encounter, and not to experience not to methods that men have told us are effective, but to Scripture itself. Second, we have to reject unbiblical and man-made practices that are often employed in spiritual warfare. Have you ever heard people say things like this, I, I pray a hedge of thorns, or I'm going to pray a hedge of thorns, or maybe you've heard people talk about generational curses and how if your ancestor had committed a sin that that curse is being visited to the third and the fourth generation of your bloodline. Uh, it's very popular to talk about bloodline curses in many deliverance ministries and spiritual warfare circles. Or maybe you've heard people talk about binding Satan, or you've heard people bind Satan in a prayer meeting, saying, I bind you, devil, or I bind the devil, or I pray a hedge of thorns around this location. Or maybe you've heard people rebuke Satan, uh, saying, I rebuke you, devil, in the name of Jesus. Or have you heard of the practice of spiritual mapping? where we name spiritual entities over different geographical realms, and then we pray against them in an attempt to bring the gospel into these areas and, and to break down the strongholds that supposedly keep cities in darkness. Or maybe you've seen or been around people who claim to have the authority and the ability to perform exorcisms. In the episodes ahead, we're going to take the opportunity to look at each of these practices. But before we do that, we need to find out what it is that Scripture means when it talks about its own sufficiency. So to that we now turn. What is the sufficiency of Scripture? Uh, what does that doctrine mean, and what are the implications of that doctrine? This is a doctrine that I think is neglected in much of the modern church today, not just in the area of spiritual war warfare, but also in the realm of church polity, church structure, uh, church leadership, philosophy of ministry, evangelism. Uh, the issue of, of sufficiency of Scripture is neglected in all of those areas. So let me define sufficiency. When we talk about biblical sufficiency, what we mean is that God has given to His people in the 66 books of Scripture all that we need for life and godliness, all that we need to live a God-honoring life that is glorifying to our Heavenly Father. He has given to us in the 66 books of Scripture all that we need for life and godliness. He's given to us all that we need for evangelism. He's given to us all that we need for disciple making, for teaching, for preaching, for reproof, for correcting people, for counseling, for parenting, for ministry, for church structure, for church growth, for our sanctification, for our edification, for giving us victory over the spiritual realm, the spiritual enemy, the devil, even for preparing us for the future and ultimately for preparing us for death. I mean, one element of living a God-glorifying life is actually being prepared for death. The Lord has provided everything that we need for life and for godliness in these 66 books of Scripture. We have all things that are necessary for that. Now, many churches will affirm the doctrine of biblical sufficiency. They'll actually say, we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. We believe that the Bible is inspired, that it is the sole authority for life and practice. You will find that 
in doctrinal statements among churches and in churches all over the country. Where we fall short and where most churches fall short is in the practical denials of that doctrine. So while most churches will affirm the sufficiency of Scripture, that we believe that Scripture alone is enough for us, they will practically deny it when they begin to implement their church ministry or when they begin to sort of live out their biblical faith. And, and here's what I mean. Take the church growth movement, for instance. The church growth movement is uh, mostly a marketing attempt to get lost people to come to our churches by dumbing down the gospel, by minimizing our emphasis on sin, by entertaining a lot of times, and by appeals to the felt needs of goats and appeals to the felt needs of even saints in an attempt to draw people into the church. That is sort of a marketing ploy that would make Madison Avenue jealous. They're always looking for, in our modern churches, the next big thing, the next big fad, the next big wave, the next big thing that will bring people in and, and build a church and to grow the church. And mostly what is meant is budgets and numbers and not necessarily people in their spiritual understanding and their ability to handle Scripture. All of these tactics are built on man's wisdoms, the world's philosophy, and worldly ways of thinking, and not on Scripture itself, and not, certainly, on Scripture alone. A lot of people deny the sufficiency of Scripture when they chase after personal and private revelations, as if Scripture has not revealed to us enough in its own pages. Take, for instance, the popularity of Sarah Young's book, Jesus Calling, and all of the myriads of products that have, that have come out of that book. She admits in that book that she thought Scripture was good, but she yearned for something more. And so she claims to have received dozens and dozens, in fact, one a day for 365 days of the year, these personal and private revelations for Jesus. Scripture was not enough for her. And the popularity of that book and of the products that are attached to that marketing effort, the popularity of that demonstrates just how people outside of our churches really think about Scripture. It demonstrates what they think about the Bible, that it really truly is not sufficient, that they would chase after or even seek after their own personal and private revelations. The craze of heaven visitations that we have going on in the church today from Don Piper's uh, 90 Minutes in Heaven, Colton Burpo's Heaven is for Real, all of those books are intended to convince us that heaven is for real, as if the testimony of Jesus in the pages of Scripture in the book of Revelation is not enough. So even though people affirm the sufficiency of Scripture verbally in their orthodox official theology. They deny it in practice, and that is one of the things that we want to address here. When we talk about the sufficiency of Scripture, it is, we're, we're saying that God, in the 66 books He has given to us in the page of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, has given to us all that we need for life and for godliness. Everything we need for church, for ministry, and for our lives to live God-glorifying and honoring lives to Him. Now, here's what we don't mean by the sufficiency of Scripture, and it's important that I clarify this. We don't mean that the Bible reveals all that can be known. The Bible is not a textbook on nuclear physics. It doesn't tell me how to make uh, apple pie. It doesn't tell me how to make cheesecake. It doesn't tell me how to smoke meat. It doesn't tell me uh, the temperature at which water boils. The Bible is not a science textbook, but in every place that the Bible touches on scientific issues, it is authoritative and it is true and it is right. So we're not saying that the Bible tells us everything that we need to know on all these other issues, but it is telling us, but we do mean that it tells us everything that we need to know to live God-honoring lives glorifying to Him. Second, when we talk about biblical sufficiency, we're not saying that the Bible reveals all spiritual truth. We're not making the claim that God has revealed to us in Scripture everything about the future. He hasn't. He has revealed enough about the future for our good. He has revealed all that we need to know about the future in order to live God-honoring and God-glorifying lives. We don't mean that the Bible reveals everything there is to know about God. There are a lot of things about God that we are not, we do not know in script, from Scripture, nor do we know it from creation. We will spend all of eternity getting to know Him better. It doesn't mean that Scripture reveals everything there is to know about heaven. Scripture says that the secret things, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed are revealed for us and for our children that we may live in obedience to Him. So there are secret things that the Lord has not revealed to us in Scripture, but He has revealed to us everything we need to know. Not everything we might want to know, not everything that could be known, but everything that we need to know. It is sufficient for us. It gives us enough. 
Nor are we saying, when we talk about the sufficiency of Scripture, that no other book is profitable, that we don't need any other human teachers. If, if I believed that, I wouldn't be offering this set of videos. I wouldn't be doing this project with American Gospel Television. Uh, it doesn't mean that the, no other teachers are needed or that there's no, nothing good to be found in other resources or study tools or commentaries or anything of that nature. But it is to say that those books can be helpful in helping us understand what it is that God has revealed to us in Scripture. All that we need for life and godliness to live glorifying, victorious, and obedient lives is revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. That is the sufficiency of Scripture. And Scripture teaches its own sufficiency. I will give to you two passages. First, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 reads this way. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And then 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2-4, through 4, Peter writes, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now I want to offer you a couple of observations on those two passages of Scripture. One of them was written by Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, one by Peter, the apostle to the Jews. These are the two most prominent and well-known of all of the apostles of the early church. In both instances, the apostles are writing right at the end of their lives. Paul is writing in 2 Timothy to Timothy, his young protege in the faith, and asking Timothy, uh, there at the very end, turning Timothy to Scripture and asking Timothy to bring him his books and, and a cloak before winter. Paul had run his race. He was expecting before too long that he would see the Lord Jesus. And he says in that, that, that passage in that book that he would receive the unfading crown of glory. And not only him, but also to all who love his appearance. Paul describes that. So this is at the end of his life. Likewise, uh, Peter in Second Peter says, I'm about to put off this earthly tent. And there at the end of his life, he is pointing people to Scripture. And it is important to note that in the case of both Peter and Paul, neither of them pointed the next generation of Christians at the end of the, ap the apostles' lives. Neither of those two apostles pointed the next generation of Christians to a pope, a council, the next generation of apostles, the next generation of prophets. Both of those men, at the end of their lives, pointed God's people back to the Word of God. Paul said it is adequate for the Christian, equipping us for every good work. It's inspired. It's given to us for the purpose of training us in righteousness. Peter says that he has given to us everything that pertains to life and to godliness. So both of those apostles pointed people back to Scripture, not to any source outside of Scripture for continuing revelation or for authority, but back to the Word of God. A second important observation there is that both of these passages describe the sufficiency of God's Word. Both of them describe that. In the life of a believer, Paul saying it's adequate, it's sufficient for everything. Peter directing his readers back to the Word of God and saying he has given to us everything that pertains to life and godliness. They cherished the Word of God and they saw in the Word of God everything that we need to live God-glorifying, obedient, and victorious Christian lives. Now, how is the sufficiency of Scripture that I've defined the doctrine and sort of illustrated the doctrine, how is it denied then by modern spiritual warfare experts in a couple of different ways. I'm going to examine the teachings of a number of modern spiritual warfare experts here in the next few episodes. And you're going to hear names like Neil T. Anderson, Mark Bubeck, Thomas White, Bill Gothard, Bob Larson, and some others. Um, they would affirm that the Bible is sufficient. They would affirm that the Bible is inspired, that it's authoritative, inerrant, and infallible. They would affirm all of those things. But the denial comes not in what they say about Scripture, but in actually how they conduct themselves in what they call spiritual warfare. For instance, these men would take as authoritative the testimony of demons that they glean in an exorcism, or the testimony of an ex-Satanist to give us insight into the spiritual realm and what works, how Satanic cults work, and how Satan works, and how he structures his kingdom, as if these ex-Satanic experts, these ex-Satanists, 
are on par with scripture itself. Or they would use experts and experience to determine what works in the spiritual realm. They might try binding Satan and praying a hedge of thorns and seeing if this loosens his power. And they would gauge the effectiveness of these techniques by what they experience in performing them and in, in, in doing them. That is how they deny the sufficiency of Scripture, as if we should elevate the testimony of a demon or the testimony of a spiritual warfare expert to the level of Scripture itself. So that's where the denial comes into play. Now, what does the denial of the sufficiency of Scripture, what are the implications of that? That's another question that we need to address. Let me give you a couple of them first. To think that God would leave us without everything that is necessary for life and godliness and that he would do this for 1,900 years until experts come along, Bob Larson, Neil T. Anderson, Mark Bubick, Thomas White, and others that could tell us how the spiritual war is to be waged. Uh, even see Peter Wagner crafted this whole methodology of, of territorial spirits and praying against territorial spirits. He said that this is one of the things that the Spirit is now revealing to the church today as if the church could be deprived of this for 2,000 years, as if the apostles wouldn't have known that this was something that was effective for evangelism and effective for Christian living. See, the implication of denying this in practice is to, is to suggest that God himself would leave his church, that would neglect his church and neglect giving this to his church for almost 2,000 years. And another implication is that it would, we would end up then suggesting that some people would have access to this information and other people wouldn't have access to this information. See, today we have deliverance ministries run by men like Bob Larson, uh, ministries started by men like Neil T. Anderson that are all about delivering us from Satan's curses, from Satan's power, from Satan's sins, from Satan's grip. That's what those ministries are designed to do. And I would suggest to you that there is no such thing as a spiritual warfare expert. As long as you are an expert in the truth, you would be an expert in spiritual warfare because it is a truth war and it is not a territory war. And we're going to get into that in the next episode. I once had somebody who brought me on their podcast and, and the, the little Chiron at the bottom, it said, Jim Osmond, spiritual warfare expert. And I had to email her back and say, uh, could you remove the spiritual warfare expert from that? Because I'm not an expert in it. There's no such thing as an expert in spiritual warfare. That's the point. You have the truth and we have the truth and we have all the truth that we need in the pages of scripture to effectively live God glorifying, victorious and obedient Christian lives. And that is the point. The church needs to recover our confidence in the sufficiency of Scripture. We lack that. And that is plaguing everything the church is doing in our day. And so I ask you, viewer, are you committed to rely on Scripture and Scripture alone for information regarding the spiritual realm and the nature of spiritual warfare? Do you long for something more? Personal revelations, visions, dreams, some inside information provided by a demon in an exorcism service or an ex-expert, an ex-Satanist expert who has now become a Christian who can tell us the secrets to waging effective spiritual warfare. Do we need these tactics? Or has God given to us everything that we need for life and godliness? Has God given to us everything that we need to effectively wage the spiritual warfare that we are called to wage? May God grant to us as his people and to his church that confidence in the sufficiency the power and the authority of Scripture and the truth that is revealed in the pages of Scripture. Well, that's our introduction. And in the next episode, we're going to talk about two different methodologies of spiritual warfare, a modern methodology and a truth methodology. I invite you to join us for that next episode. Thank you for watching.